No medical mystery is as common as thyroid problems. Despite various advancements in technology, the medical community is still struggling to find the answers for these problems. Thus, this often leads to misdiagnosis and slow recovery rates. Medical Medium Thyroid Healing seeks to help people facing various thyroid problems. This book contains all the necessary information readers need to know about the thyroid, while also providing them with a comprehensive list of causes, symptoms, and ways to avoid these problems. Part 1. Thyroid Revelations The Truth About Your Thyroid More often than not, patients who have been diagnosed with thyroid-related diseases leave their doctor with more questions than answers. In a way, they're grateful for the fact that what they have has a name, that it's not a complete medical mystery. Unfortunately, they are also told that what they are experiencing is an autoimmune response. That is, the body creating a protective response against the thyroid and attacking it over time. However, why does the body attack itself? Moreover, what might cause the body to do such a harmful thing to itself? The answers to these questions will be laid down in this book in a comprehensive and informative way. Before we delve into the details, the author reminds us that the first thing we have to do is to stop blaming ourselves. After all, with everything we're dealing with because of our illness, The last thing we need is to feel guilty about it. Keep in mind that what we feel, all symptoms, illnesses, and suffering, are not created by our thoughts or by our acts. Neither is it a punishment from the universe, nor a result of karma. Instead, the author lets us in on something he discovered throughout the course of his work that these thyroid related illnesses are caused by a thyroid virus. Thus, it's not the body attacking the thyroid gland, it's actually a virus attacking it. Additionally, the author also shares that the virus doesn't just attack the thyroid gland. In fact, it attacks the gland when it's already at the third stage of its attacks. Unfortunately, its attacks are so subtle that we hardly experience any symptom. On a positive note, however, the author emphasizes that we can do something about this virus. All answers to our thyroid concerns will be addressed in this book, and the author even guarantees that we will all become experts by the time we reach the last chapter. Thyroid Virus Triggers The first thing we have to recognize are virus triggers. According to the author, these triggers are the fuels which help the virus speed up its reproduction. These triggers may come from physiological responses, environmental stressors, or food we eat. To help us identify stressors, the author lists them down as follows. Mold Being exposed to mold weakens our immune system, which also makes us more susceptible to the virus. Mercury The author shares that mercury is a favorite food of the virus, so we must avoid being exposed to it as much as possible. Sources of mercury include tuna, swordfish, and getting metal fillings removed. Mercury can also be genetically passed down to us. Zinc Deficiency Having low levels of zinc greatly contributes to thyroid virus vulnerability. It can either be inherited or caused by poor nutrition. Vitamin B12 deficiency compromises the nervous system, liver, and other organs which help control the virus from growing. Exposure to pesticides 
herbicides, and insecticides leads us to be exposed to certain toxins which encourage the virus's growth. The same toxins can be inhaled from fresh paint. Emotional trauma can also weaken our immune system by releasing hormones which help feed the virus. These negative emotions can be triggered by the death of a loved one, a broken heart, the feeling of betrayal, worrying about your finances, or watching loved ones suffer from painful experiences. Hormonal changes like puberty, pregnancy, and childbirth can also produce a similar effect. Medications, if improperly taken, can also weaken the immune system. Always make sure that you stick to your doctor's prescribed regimen to experience the medicine's optimum effect. Recreational drug use is also discouraged, since these drugs often contain harmful toxins which feed the virus. Physical injuries can effectively wear out our bodies, and this can signal the virus to try and take over your body. Swimming. The author explains that the presence of red algae in bodies of water during the summer reduces the amount of oxygen in the water, which in turn encourages the growth of bacteria. When we're exposed to these bacteria, our immune system also weakens, making it easier for the virus to take over. Runoffs contain heavy metal and other toxins which viruses feed off, so it's best to avoid swimming in lakes exposed to runoffs. Not getting enough rest can also weaken the immune system. More on this will be discussed in later chapters. Insect Bites When we are bitten by insects, they inject venom into our skin, which can make it susceptible to infections. These infections can signal the thyroid virus to wake up from its dormancy. With all these triggers in mind, the author reminds us that we should not be intimidated. We must always keep in mind that we have the right to enjoy life without illnesses. After all, these triggers are avoidable, and the information contained in this book can help us protect ourselves and our loved ones from the destructive thyroid virus. How the Thyroid Virus Works At this point, we are now more curious about the thyroid virus, how we can catch it, and how it works. This chapter seeks to answer all these questions. The author begins his discussion by sharing that the thyroid virus can be easily passed on to us. We can catch it by simply sharing a drink with our friends, from kissing our partner, eating food prepared by an infected cook, being sneezed on, getting a blood transfusion, by using a public bathroom, or by inheriting it from our parents. However, the worst part about catching this virus lies in the fact that its initial symptoms are so mild that we barely notice it wrecking havoc in our system. So, what exactly is the thyroid virus? The author explains that this is a pathogen more commonly known as the Epstein-Barr virus, or EBV. The EBV is a virus in the herpes family that is known to cause glandular fever, or mononucleosis. It has existed for over hundreds of years, thereby creating mutations and new strains throughout the process. These strains can be categorized into six groups, which are around 10 subtypes per group, which explains why different people experience different symptoms despite being infected by the same virus. The EBV is also known to have four stages. Nevertheless, before the author discusses these stages, the author deems it necessary to discuss the different viral poisons first. 
These viral poisons are the toxic castoffs of the virus as it reproduces and are responsible for making matters worse as the virus progresses. Viral byproduct. Just like any living matter, EBV consumes food and excretes its toxic waste matter. Unfortunately, their byproduct can cause the mitral valve to gum up and eventually create heart palpitations. Viral corpses. Each virus cell has a lifespan of around six weeks, and those that die off remain in our system as toxic cell corpses, which can clog up the liver and the lymphatic system. This causes fatigue, weight gain, constipation, bloating, hot flashes, and other similar conditions. Neurotoxins are byproducts of the EBV, which can cause inflammations in our nerves. Dermatoxins, another byproduct, slows down the functioning of the liver and the lymphatic system. As a result, we experience skin irritations, pain, itching, rashes, or a combination of these conditions. With all these in mind, we are now ready to be acquainted with the four stages of the EBV. 1. The author calls the first stage as the baby stage. This is the time when we first catch the disease. Since the virus largely remains dormant during this stage, symptoms often include mild fatigue, sore throats, earaches, or flus. Fortunately, the virus is still highly vulnerable at this stage and can be easily treated through antiviral measures, which are to be discussed later in this book. 2. The second stage is the war stage. This is the stage when the virus wakes up from its dormancy. This is often triggered by our weakened immune system and begins with mononucleosis, otherwise known as mono. During this stage, the EBV and our immune system is constantly at war with each other but only until the virus senses that it can't stay active for a long time. Once it senses this threat, the virus picks an organ in our body where it can remain dormant until another trigger comes along. 3. The third stage is the thyroid stage, or the stage when people often get diagnosed with thyroid problems. During this stage, the virus becomes extremely active and sends out toxins into the liver and the bloodstream, which also confuses the lymphocytes guarding the thyroid area. As a result of this confusion, the virus successfully takes burrows into the thyroid gland and settles there. Unfortunately, the deeper the virus is into the thyroid gland, the harder it is to be destroyed. This eventually leads into the diagnosis of thyroid issues which are often dismissed as aging, menopause, or being autoimmune. 4. The final stage is the mystery illness stage. During this stage, the virus affects a person neurologically, while virus cells which remain in stage 2 and stage 3 continue to wreak havoc in our body. This is considered as the most debilitating of the four stages, and fortunately, not a lot of people ever reach this stage. However, those who do reach this stage experience adrenal and neurological fatigue, which still remains a mystery to the medical community. Nonetheless, the author reminds us that we have the ability to regain control and rebuild our immune system, even when we are already experiencing stage 4 EBV. Nevertheless, in order to do so, we must first understand our thyroid's true purpose. Your thyroid's true purpose. The thyroid is the gland located in the front of our neck, and because of its relatively small size, 
we often dismiss it as a gland with insignificant functions. However, that is not the case. The author shares that despite its size, the thyroid is actually the body's second brain. It serves as the body's data center and is responsible for recording everything that happens in our body, what's functioning or not, or what's toxic or not. The data recorded is then used by the thyroid to send out signals to delegate tasks to the various organs to keep everything balanced and fully functional. In addition, it is interesting that the thyroid still performs its job despite being infected by the EBV or has been surgically removed. The author explains this phenomenon by stating that the thyroid is also responsible for the production of the thyroxine, T4, and triodiothyronine, T3, hormones. These hormones play a vital role in keeping the immune system balanced by preventing overreaction or underreaction to stimulus or by supporting the functions of the pancreas. Fortunately, the liver has a storage bin of T4 hormones, which converts into T3, which the body uses whenever the thyroid can't perform this function. Additionally, the thyroid also produces two additional hormones. These hormones, which the author refers to as R5 and R6, are responsible for the messaging and monitoring functions of the thyroid. In addition, thanks to our adrenal glands, our body will not replete with R5 and R6 hormones even when the thyroid is under attack. With all these in mind, we begin to show how resilient our body can be. The problem, however, lies in the fact that the EBV also feeds on adrenaline. Thus, although the adrenal glands produce adrenaline to keep the body's equilibrium, it also provides food for the EBV. Moreover, as long as the virus has a means to survive, it will not stop until it has taken over our central nervous system. Fortunately, there is a way to stop the virus's proliferation. However, before we dwell on the specifics of prevention, we must first understand its symptoms and conditions in order to guarantee a more targeted and efficient treatment. Your Symptoms and Conditions Explained As previously stated, our thyroid issues are not the problem itself. They are mere symptoms of the real threat. In this chapter, the author discusses all EBV-related symptoms which we have to look out for. After all, these symptoms will guide us in determining the appropriate treatment for the virus. Hypothyroidism We experience hypothyroidism when the EBV digs deep into the thyroid tissue, which greatly weakens the gland. This is considered as an early stage case of thyroiditis and is characterized by fluctuations in body temperature, dry skin, and fatigue. Hyperthyroidism and Graves disease are also known symptoms of being infected by the EBV. The author shares that there are instances when the virus causes the thyroid to overproduce hormones. As a result, we experience bulging eyes, a swelling in the throat, and a large thyroid, fluctuating body temperature, and fatigue. Inflammation is the body's way of protecting itself in case of invasion or injury. Thus, when we experience inflammation, either in the form of a sore throat or a puffy splinter, this is the body telling us that it is actively fighting off pathogens like EBV. Thyroid nodules, cysts, and tumors. Being diagnosed with these lumps of cells can be quite scary. 
but think of them as the body's way of battling with the EBV. Additionally, keep in mind that cancerous tumors result from a combination of EBV and toxins, so treatment must be targeted against both of them. Metabolism problems can also tell us whether we're infected by the EBV or not. Related symptoms include mystery weight gain or loss and being constantly hungry. A more detailed discussion of metabolism is discussed in part two of this book. Patients also report experiencing sleep issues. These problems include insomnia, restlessness, fatigue, tiredness, anxiety, and changes in energy level. Since sleep is a vital element to guarantee our full recovery, part four of this book is entirely dedicated towards addressing our sleep issues and helping us overcome them. The EBV is also known to affect our neurotransmitters, which can cause patients to experience numbness, tingles, spasms, and twitches. Other notable symptoms of viral infections include an inability to concentrate, memory loss, heightened sensitivity to changing temperatures, fluctuating body temperatures, being extremely moody and irritable, and edema. With all these symptoms, it would be easier for experts to determine where the EBV is, what kind of strand it is, and at what stage it is. This would greatly help them in preparing a treatment, which would effectively kill off the virus. Only then can we be on the true path to recovery. Thyroid cancer. Cancer is probably the worst kind of disease a person can suffer from, and much of our fear of cancer can be attributed to the fact that it still remains a mystery. In this chapter, the author gives us the lowdown on the thyroid cancer virus. The author believes that the disease is formed when EBV feeds off toxins, thereby creating mutated strains of EBV, which is responsible for the formation of cancer. These mutated EBV continues to feed off toxins and viral byproduct, which makes it stronger as it keeps on mutating. This cycle goes on until these virus cells produce a chemical compound which transforms them into cancer cells. These cancer cells know that they have a better chance for survival when they're clustered together, which explains why cancer is often accompanied by a diagnosis involving bodily tumors. However, being infected with the EBV doesn't mean that you're already experiencing thyroid cancer. The author reminds us that only certain groups of EBV can cause cancer cells to form. And even if we did get infected, it still requires exposure to a significant amount of toxins in order to form. From the foregoing, the author now concludes that we only have two major steps to take in order to gain control of our life. One, to lower our viral load. Two, to effectively eliminate exposure to and ingestion of toxins. In addition, fortunately, this book provides us with various advice which can help us incorporate the above-mentioned steps into our day-to-day -day life. Thyroid Guest Tests The author starts this chapter by discussing the two types of doctors. The first type, or the traditional doctors, are the ones who diagnose a patient based on the latter's thyroid-stimulating hormone, TSH, levels. These levels determine whether a person's thyroid is fine or not depending on the TSH range their results fall under. On the other hand, the second type of doctors acknowledges that even when a person's TSH levels are on the normal range, 
they still experience thyroid issues. Because of this, they tend to investigate deeper about the disease. However, even with the presence of the second type of doctors, we can't seem to move forward because the tools used, the thyroid tests, are still outdated. The author explains that our current thyroid tests are focused on the idea that we experience health issues because our thyroid is sick. However, as previously discussed, our thyroid is perfectly fine. It is the EBV that's causing all the problems. With this thought, the author encourages the development of tests, which are geared towards detecting EBV. These tests should be able to track where the virus is, where it has traveled to, where it has rested during its dormant phase, whether it has already mutated or not, and what and how it feeds. For this reason, the author shares two useful tests to help us determine the presence of EBV in our body. 1. Thyroid hormone tests determine the amount of T4, T3, and TSH present in a person's body. When a person's thyroid hormones are below the normal level, it could be a sign that there is a virus infection in our system. The problem with these tests is the possible inaccuracy due to a person's changing hormonal levels. As a tip, the author encourages getting tested several times in a month and getting the average of the results. 2. The author lays more emphasis on the second test, which is the thyroid antibodies test. Our bodies release antibodies to fight off viruses and bacteria, so an increased presence of antibodies should signal us of possible EVB presence. Keep in mind, however, that these tests are not conclusive as to the absence or presence of pathogens in the entire body. After all, they merely focus on the thyroid. More particularly, they will serve as a guide as to whether or not a person has to take thyroid medication. Thyroid Medication When a person is diagnosed with thyroid issues based on traditional testing, they are often prescribed with thyroid medication. However, before you take these medications, it is best to learn more about them in this chapter. The author shares that current thyroid medication are steroids which help a person to become more energetic, mentally alert, and experience better sleep. However, all these experiences are merely temporary and do not really address the viral issue. Thus, the temporary relief merely makes the patient forget the fact that a virus is taking over his body. This explains why long-term symptoms like hair loss and weight gain still occur despite taking thyroid medication. With that said, the author has likened taking thyroid medication to putting a band-aid over a deep wound. It is also worth noting that thyroid medication also has an adverse long-term side effect. The author explains that these steroids train the thyroid to produce less hormones. Over time, and with increasing dosages, the thyroid eventually dumbs itself down and slowly degenerates. Moreover, since the thyroid is the body's data center, then we can only imagine how adverse its effects will be to the body as a whole. Nonetheless, the author warns us against abruptly stopping thyroid medication. Instead, he encourages us to slowly wean off the medication to avoid shocking the liver and other organs which work hand-in-hand -hand with the prescription. It is highly advised to talk to your doctor about your plan to go into detox so that he can prescribe lower dosages over time. Part 2 
The Great Mistakes in Your Way A Bridge to Better Health The second part of this book deals with the various mistakes which provides a gap on our road to recovery. Fortunately, these gaps are not the dead-end type which leaves us with no recourse. Bridges can be built on these gaps and we can use these bridges in order to improve our overall health. Before beginning the discussion under part two of this book, the author reminds us that mistakes are a normal part of life. It is so ingrained in our daily life that it is already considered as a normal human experience. In addition, as the saying goes, we learn from our mistakes. The great mistakes under part two of this book, however, are not the same as our ordinary day-to-day -day mistakes. The author likens these great mistakes to grave mistakes, mistakes that we are not accountable for, but we have to pay attention for them nonetheless. The author identified nine great mistakes, all of which will be discussed in detail in the succeeding chapters. Understanding these grave mistakes and building a bridge on them helps us realize that the chronic illnesses we're suffering from is not our own doing. We are not to blame for how our body reacts. Once we ease up to that thought, then we can finally learn to trust ourselves. Moreover, with that self-trust and love, then we can finally begin our journey to improve our health. Great mistake number one, autoimmune confusion. A common misconception about thyroid problems is that it is caused by an autoimmune response. Unfortunately, this misconception holds us back from obtaining reliable data from research sources since we're focused on the wrong things. Thus, it is for this reason that the author aims to debunk the age-old autoimmune theory. According to this theory, the body is attacking itself because it has sensed the thyroid as a foreign element, which it must fight off. The truth, however, is that the virus has burrowed deep into the gland, and it is the same virus that the body is attacking, not the thyroid gland itself. Unfortunately, tests being run at this point are not geared towards detecting these harmful pathogens. According to the author, tests which are specifically made to detect these pathogens have not yet been invented. Nevertheless, it is advised for patients and medical practitioners alike to acknowledge that the body is not attacking itself. When patients are notified that their body is having an autoimmune response, they end up feeling betrayed by their own body. In effect, they feel helpless and lose interest in trying to heal. This should never be the case. To conclude, the author lays emphasis on being honest with the patient. Always keep in mind that acknowledging the viral issue not only helps the patient regain control of his body, but will also help you in finding the appropriate cure. Great mistake number two, mystery illness misconception. The second great mistake is the mystery illness misconception. We tend to associate mystery illnesses with the rare ailments contracted by children in far-flung areas. The author, however, does not believe in this view. According to the author, a mystery illness is an ailment which leaves people with more questions than answers. This means that patients and doctors alike are left in the dark about the results of the diagnosis. Usually, these mystery illnesses have no name. Nonetheless, there are also instances where named illnesses possess the same mysterious quality. In fact, there are about 5,000 health issues which are considered as mystery illnesses. However, the problem doesn't lie in the fact that EBV-related illnesses 
are considered as mystery illnesses. Instead, it lies in the fact that we are struck with a broken system, a system that's afraid of not knowing the answers. They fear that if they can't answer questions, their credibility will be damaged. Thus, they resort to means which will keep patients from asking questions. To conclude this chapter, the author encourages us that the first step towards addressing this mistake is to acknowledge that certain illnesses and diseases remain a mystery to us. Once we acknowledge this as a fact, we begin to ignite an awareness among the public, which can also inspire them to help look for answers. Great mistake number three, labels as answers. The third great mistake is our reliance on labels as the answer to our problems. We often feel relieved when we find out that what we're experiencing has a name, especially when that label is known to be treatable. The author, however, believes that this reliance on labels makes us docile which is quite problematic. He explains that once we're diagnosed with a condition that has a name, we rarely ask about it. We are no longer curious about how we caught it in the first place or what its effects are on our overall health. This mentality is highly discouraged for two reasons. First, keep in mind that misdiagnosis can happen. Being a mystery to the medical community means that it may be beyond the scope of testing. Second, the label given to these diagnoses don't give us the answers we need. Keep in mind that these diseases are named after who discovered them, but that doesn't always mean that the discovery had an accompanying remedy. In the alternative, If you are diagnosed with a disease which made you feel helpless, keep in mind that it is just a label and not a full disclosure of what you're suffering from. Don't be bogged down by labels. Great mistake number four, inflammation as cause. Health-related publications are replete with information attributing chronic illnesses to inflammation. Because of this misconception, we were advised to add anti-inflammatory food into our diet and avoid those which are inflammatory like grain and processed goods. However, there are people well over their 90s who eat grains on a daily basis and are still and are still perfectly healthy. This simply goes to show that inflammation should not be seen as a cause but as an indicator of an underlying infection or injury. After all, inflammation is a result of an invasion of pathogens like EBV, shingles, or streptococcus, to name a few. The author shares that because of this misconception, experts tend to focus on testing the levels of inflammation in a person's body and put a label on it based on what disease it is most similar to. Unfortunately, this method makes these tests inconclusive of what you are suffering from. Additionally, the author also shares that research laboratories merely come up with charts which assign diseases to particular levels of inflammation. These charts help them analyze blood samples, but it doesn't help them test for the pathogens themselves. In addition, without knowing that the body is infected with pathogens, there is no way of knowing the identity of the specific pathogen, something which is crucial to the patient's treatment. From the foregoing facts, the author shares that whenever we are diagnosed with inflammation, we must keep in mind that it is a result of having a pathogenic invader in our body. This will help us accept that our body is not destroying itself. In turn, this will help us develop a positive perspective about our overall health, and only then can we be on the path to true recovery. 
Great mistake number five, metabolism myth. Whenever we hear the word metabolism, we always associate it with the speed by which our body is able to digest the food we eat. We have come to acknowledge that we were born with fast metabolism, which eventually slows down as we age. However, this is all a myth. According to the author, metabolism simply refers to the fact that the body is alive and that it is capable of digesting food and converting it to energy. This fact and the speed by which our body performs these acts remains the same regardless of age. Nonetheless, metabolism has always been associated with weight gain, even though no explanation has ever been offered to prove it. Thus, the author feels the responsibility to shatter this metabolism myth and provide us with facts. According to him, weight issues have nothing to do with age nor calories. Instead, it has something to do with our vital organs, the liver, the lymphatic system, heart, pituitary gland, kidney, and intestines. When our body encounters a virus, both the liver and the lymphatic system slows down. Since these organs are responsible for the detoxification process, slowing them down meant the continued presence of harmful toxins in the body. As an emergency protective measure, the body thereby retains fluids so that toxins would remain suspended. Thus, we experience weight gain. From this explanation, we can see that weight gain has more to do with infections and nothing to do with metabolism. However, since the metabolism myth has been in existence since time immemorial, the author recognizes that it may be hard for us to accept his proposal. Nonetheless, he reminds us that full recovery is achieved only when we let go of burdensome misconceptions. Great mistake number six, gene blame game. Another great mistake that's hard to swallow is that chronic illnesses are genetic. True enough, we inherit some traits from our parents, but the author believes that we do not get chronic illnesses from them. In this chapter, the author shares that our bodies are naturally geared towards being healthy. But if we believe that chronic diseases are inherited and correlate it to the fact that people suffering from these diseases have quadrupled over the past years, then it would mean that our genes are evolving for the worst. This simply runs counter to the fact that we are meant to be born healthy. According to the author, what's really inherited are the pathogens and not the faulty genes. Additionally, we must also consider that family members live in the same environment and are therefore exposed to the same triggers. This explains why family members have the same illnesses. Older members simply develop symptoms earlier because the virus had already been in their bodies for a longer period of time. Thus, what causes a person to be sick is a compromised immune system which may either be due to environmental exposure to pathogens or due to contracting them at conception. It has nothing to do with a genetic mutation which has been passed down from generation to generation. Great mistake number seven. Ignoring the unforgiving four. The author lays much emphasis on the unforgiving four. According to him, these four factors are the real problems behind developing chronic diseases. Unfortunately, most of us tend to ignore these factors, which, accordingly, is a grave mistake. The unforgiving four are as follows. 1. Radiation Radiation as a health threat is often ignored simply because the numbers attributing diseases to it are minimal. Nonetheless, it must be noted 
that radiation can overheat the thyroid gland, which can also cause the immune system to weaken. In addition, when our immune system is weak, EBV can easily take over. 2. Viral Explosion As previously discussed, most of our diseases are due to viruses, and when these pathogens are coupled with toxins, it can trigger the worst forms of diseases. What's worse, however, is the fact that these viruses can mutate into more hazardous pathogens when they are not properly treated. Thus, there is a need for the medical community to focus on fighting off these viruses for the long run instead of just temporary solutions. 3. Dichlorodiphenyl trichloroethane, DDT DDT used to be a popular component of pesticides, but has been discontinued due to its adverse effects on the environment. Additionally, exposure to this substance can also weaken the immune system and break down our liver. Unfortunately, although its use has already been discouraged, its traces still remain afloat today. 4. Toxic Heavy Metals In a previous chapter, the author discussed that the EBV feeds on toxic heavy metals. Thus, exposure to these metals can promote the EBV's development in our body. All of these may seem too overwhelming and scary. Fortunately, gaining knowledge about the Unforgiving Four can also help us in avoiding them. Great mistake number eight. It's all in your head. Perhaps the worst part of being sick is that it can make you feel like life is unfair. You begin to question what you've done wrong to contract this disease, while you watch your friends proceed with their normal lives. This feeling is especially true when what you've contracted is a chronic disease. To make matters worse, not much is known about certain chronic illnesses that even the medical community is left hanging. People with good intentions often try to help by saying, it's all in your head. However, this is doing more bad than good. Being told that what you're feeling is all in your head can be quite frustrating. In certain cases, the frustration becomes too extreme that some patients would go to a psychiatrist to search for answers. Patients eventually lose their self-confidence, and this can be straining to their relationships. The author admits that this idea can hurt everyone, the patient, his doctor, and his loved ones. Being told that what they're feeling is all a product of their imagination can cause patients to withdraw from looking for answers. This should never be the case. Great mistake number nine. You created your illness. The final great mistake is attributing that your illnesses are manifestations of your thoughts. The author wants to set things straight at the onset of this chapter. Your thoughts are not to blame for your illness. Keep in mind that when we entertain the idea that our sufferings are manifestations of our thoughts, then we also limit the control we have over our lives. To help us realize that believing in this idea is a great mistake, the author gives us an example of a perfectly healthy person who is always bogged down by negative thoughts. In contrast, there are also people who are suffering from chronic illnesses, but who nonetheless possess a positive outlook. He explains that, No matter how negative our thoughts can be, they can never magically transform into a deadly tumor. At this point, the author wants to emphasize that what truly makes us sick are the pathogens and toxins which make their way into our bodies. Accepting this 
can help us rest easy, knowing that we can never conjure up a deadly disease with our thoughts. Additionally, the author also discourages parents from developing this mindset among children. This will not only help them grow into worry-free adults, but it can also change the way the next generation will think about chronic diseases. Part 3. Thyroid Resurrection Time to Rebuild Your Body The third part of this book shares various tips on how we can restore the body to its full functionality, and it all starts with taking care of our thyroid. At this point, we already know that our true enemy is the EBV. Thus, our efforts must be geared towards eliminating it. Nonetheless, the author makes it clear that we shouldn't get rid of all EBV cells in our body. He reassures us that this will not have any adverse effect since the purpose of the remaining dormant EBV cells is to keep the immune system alert. The tips listed down in the succeeding chapters are especially relevant to those who received iodine treatments or those who even had their thyroid glands removed. However, this does not prevent anyone from doing so, especially if they wish to protect their thyroid from any potential threat. We must also keep in mind that thyroid resurrection is a long journey. We won't see the results in an instant. Nevertheless, with patience and constant efforts, we will eventually experience the positive results of this project. Life without a thyroid It is not uncommon for some people to have their thyroid removed or treated to the point of rendering it seemingly useless. However, in these instances, it can be said that the thyroid is still performing its functions since the body still believes that your thyroid is still wholly intact. To explain, the author shares that although we've had our thyroid surgically removed, part of it still remains. In other words, the foundation of your thyroid gland is still attached. Additionally, studies reveal that even if we're only left with just 1% of the entire thyroid tissue, this is still enough to produce decent amounts of T4, T3, R5, and R6 hormones which are necessary for the body's full functionality. Fortunately, we can rebuild our thyroid from the remaining tissue. This is a necessary step towards our full recovery, not just because it can help us produce more hormones, but because it also reduces the adrenal's production of EBV triggers. You may find, however, that the thought of resurrecting our thyroid is impossible. Nevertheless, the author shares that our thyroid tissue is fully capable of regenerating over time. All that is required of us is to get into the mindset of being healed in order to obtain the best results. Common Misconceptions and What to Avoid The author lists down what we have to take note of if we want to experience the full effects of recovery. Among them are the following. Avoid iodine. Although iodine is known to be an effective antiviral and antibacterial agent, it can lead to inflammation, which can be easily mistaken as an autoimmune response. Avoid the wrong kind of zinc. Although zinc deficiency can awaken a dormant EBV, taking in the wrong kind of zinc also has adverse effects. Research reveals that having too much zinc in the body leads to mineral copper loss and that can take a toll on our health. The author recommends drinking liquid zinc sulfate, which not only helps us avoid zinc deficiency, but also targets and eliminates toxic copper from our system. There is no such thing as goiter-causing food. The belief that certain fruits and vegetables are goitrogenic is a myth. The truth, however, 
is that the thyroid relies on these foods in order to be fully functional. This includes kale, cauliflower, cabbage, pears, peaches, and strawberries, to name a few. As much as possible, try to avoid foods which are also considered the EBV's favorite snacks. Foods such as eggs, cheese, milk, butter, cream, gluten, canola, non-organic corn, soy, and pork. It is normal to feel discouraged after looking at the long list of food to avoid. We must keep in mind that we do not have to stop eating all of these at once. We can gradually remove them from our diet so that the transition will not be as hard for us. Powerful Foods, Herbs, and Supplements for Healing Now that we already have an idea of what we should avoid, the author now presents us with a longer list of food and supplements which we can eat. Our body needs nourishment, after all. Artichokes contain phytochemical compounds, which aids in the restoration of the thyroid gland itself. Additionally, these compounds can help shrink tumors so that the EBVs hiding inside them are directly exposed to our immune system. Other food which contain phytochemicals include basil and avocados. Aloe vera gel is an antiviral food which can help flush out toxins from the bloodstream. Other antiviral food include thyme, radish, garlic, fennel, coconut, and basil. Apples and asparagus contain anti-inflammatory properties which starves the virus, thereby preventing it from reproducing. Atlantic sea vegetables like dulce and kelp contain the right amount of iodine which serves as an antiseptic for the thyroid. Food rich in hydrochloric acid and calcium blocks the EBV from further damaging the thyroid. This includes Lime, lemon, orange, tangerine, and papaya. Tomatoes and papaya contain high levels of vitamin C, which helps cleanse the liver. It also provides additional support to the thyroid's own immune system. Sprouts and microgreens contain micronutrients, which reduces and prevents the growth of harmful nodules. Cruciferous vegetables like broccoli, cauliflower, and cabbage are rich in sulfur content, which renders the virus incapable of performing its functions. Other foods which help in the restoration and growth of thyroid tissues include turmeric, watercress, wild berries, sweet potatoes, squash, spinach, raw honey, and potatoes. Aside from the food listed above, It is also important to take the necessary supplements which can speed up the healing process. Like vitamin B12, liquid zinc sulfate, vitamin C, 1 lysin, 5 methyl tetrahydrofolate, monolaurin, silver hydrosol, 1 tyrosine, B complex, magnesium, eicosapentaenoic acid, docosahexaenoic acid, selenium, curcumin, chromium, vitamin D, manganese, copper, and rubidium. Helpful herbs include spirulina, cat's claw, licorice root, lemon balm, chaga mushroom, star anise, bacopa manieri, red clover, elderberry, bladder rack, nettle leaf, red marine algae, ashwagandha, and barley grass. These herbs are either rich in phytochemicals or contain antiviral properties or contain antiviral properties which can effectively target the EBV. 90-day thyroid rehab. At this point, we now have a list of both the EBV friendly and EBV destroying foods. In this chapter, the author encouraged us to go on a 90-day cleanse using his carefully prepared meal plans. 
The author has prepared three choices for us, each of which would be sufficient for a 30-day period. We are also given the option to mix and match the plans in order to determine which one would be most effective depending on our particular needs. Recipes for these meals will be discussed in the next chapter. Choice A. Liver, Lymphatic, and Gut Release Month In Choice A, you start the morning by drinking 16 ounces of celery juice. This must be done on an empty stomach. At midday or in the afternoon, you drink around 16 ounces of lemon or lime water. In the late afternoon, drink another 16 ounces of lemon or lime water. Finally, you end the night with 16 ounces of aloe water or cucumber juice. During this period, try to remove eggs, dairy, gluten, canola, corn, soy, and pork from your diet. This plan works since your busy organs are given additional support while the antiviral properties also attacks the EBV in your system. Choice B. Heavy Metal Detox Month Start the day by drinking 16 ounces of celery juice. For 30 days, you must drink the Heavy Metal Detox Smoothie for breakfast. At midday or early afternoon, drink 16 ounces of lime or lemon water. In the late afternoon, drink 16 ounces of ginger water. Then, in the evening, drink around 16 ounces of aloe water or cucumber juice. As an alternative, in case you don't have access to these ingredients, you can opt to drink lemon water instead. Just like in choice A, Try to avoid the unproductive food like eggs and cheese. Additionally, avoid tuna, swordfish, and bass during this period. Choice C. Thyroid Virus Cleanse Month While still on an empty stomach, drink 16 ounces of celery juice in the morning. For breakfast, drink the thyroid healing smoothie. At midday or early afternoon, Drink around 16 ounces of lemon or lime water. Within the day, drink one cup of ginger water and then one cup of thyroid healing tea. During dinner or at any time, drink at least one cup of thyroid healing broth. Finally, drink at least 16 ounces of thyroid healing juice every evening. In addition to the prohibitions in the previous chapter, you must also reduce your fat intake by around 25%. It is advised to have only one portion of animal protein per day during this month. Thyroid Healing Recipes The author lays down his recommended recipes for the meals mentioned in the previous chapters. These recipes have been categorized into juices, teas and broth, breakfast, lunch, dinner, and snacks. Juices, tea, waters, and broth. Thyroid healing juice. For this juice, you will need one bunch of celery, two apples, one bunch of cilantro, and two to four inches of fresh ginger. Thoroughly clean all these ingredients and run them through the juicer. As much as possible, use all organic ingredients. Thyroid Healing Tea You will need 2 cups of water, 1 teaspoon of thyme, 1 teaspoon fennel seed, 1 teaspoon lemon balm, and 2 teaspoons of raw honey. Bring the water to a boil, then add thyme, fennel seed, and lemon balm. Turn off the water and allow to cool for around 15 minutes. Add honey to taste. Ginger Water you will need 1 to 2 inches of fresh ginger, 2 cups of water, half a lemon, and 2 teaspoons of raw honey. Begin by grating the ginger into the water and add the juice of the lemon. Leave the water for at least 15 minutes or you can put it in the fridge overnight. 
Add honey or lemon to add to the taste before drinking. Aloe water. You will need a 2 inch piece of fresh and organic aloe leaf and 2 cups of water. Place the scooped out aloe gel and water into a blender and blend until thoroughly mixed. Thyroid healing broth. You will need 2 sliced sweet potatoes, 2 celery stalks, 2 onions, 6 garlic cloves, 1 inch turmeric root, 1 cup of chopped parsley, 4 sprigs of thyme, 2 tablespoons of Atlantic Dulce Flakes, 1 tablespoon of kelp powder, and 8 cups of water. Mix all of these ingredients into a boil and then simmer for around an hour. Breakfast Apple porridge with cinnamon and raisins. You will need three sliced apples, a quarter teaspoon of cinnamon, one pinch of vanilla bean powder, two pitted dates, one teaspoon of raw honey, half a lemon, a quarter cup of raisins, two tablespoons of walnuts, two tablespoons of shredded coconut. Place all the ingredients in a food processor until all of them are thoroughly mixed. You may opt to add walnuts, coconut, raisins, or raw honey, depending on your desired flavor. Heavy Metal Detox Smoothie You will need two bananas, two cups of wild berries, a cup of cilantro, one teaspoon of barley grass juice powder, one teaspoon of Hawaiian spirulina, one tablespoon of Atlantic Dulce, one orange, and a cup of water. Mix all of these into a blender and allow to blend until smooth. Thyroid Healing Smoothie You will need 2 cups of mango, 1 banana, and a cup of water. Blend all of these ingredients until smooth. You may also add ginger, raspberries, spinach, kelp powder, or arugula, depending on your taste. Lunch Mixed vegetable salad. Layer red cabbage, carrots, asparagus, sliced radish, fennel, celery, cilantro, parsley, scallion, lemon, avocado, spinach, or arugula into a mason jar. Store these vegetables in the fridge for up to three days. Serve this with a salad dressing made from blended Brazil nuts, cashews, celery, garlic, parsley, dill, celery seeds, sea salt, lemon, and water. Fruit salad with leafy greens. Layer oranges, raspberries, mangoes, cucumber, pomegranate seeds, cilantro, basil, lime, and leafy greens into a mason jar. Allow to chill in the fridge for up to three days and serve with freshly squeezed lemon juice. Spinach Soup You will need one and a half cup of grape tomatoes, one stalk of celery, one garlic clove, one orange, four cups of baby spinach, two basil leaves, and half an avocado. Begin by blending the tomatoes, celery, garlic, and orange juice. Once smooth, Add the spinach until it is completely incorporated into the soup. At your option, you may add basil and avocado to add to the taste. Dinner Steamed artichokes with garlic cashew aioli. Steam the artichokes for around 30 to 40 minutes. While steaming, combine cashews, olive oil, garlic, lemon juice, sea salt, and water into a blender to create a thick aioli. Serve the artichokes with the aioli. Cauliflower Fried Rice Put cauliflower into a food processor until it reaches a rice-like texture. Saute onion, ginger, garlic, carrot, bell pepper, celery, and place into a pan with one teaspoon of coconut oil. When you notice the vegetable soften, add the cauliflower rice, toasted sesame oil, coconut aminos, honey, 
and sea salt. Stir well until the cauliflower rice is tender. Snacks Wild Blueberry Banana Ice Cream Put three large frozen bananas and a cup of wild berries into a food processor and pulse until it creates a soft serve ice cream consistency. Place one cup of wild berries into a food processor to create the sauce. The author also recommends the grab and go snack combos of cauliflower and apples, tomatoes and spinach, celery and dates, banana and dulce flakes, kale and mango, pears and arugula, wild berries and papaya, and tangerine and raspberries. Thyroid Healing Techniques Now that we have been acquainted with the various thyroid healing recipes, the author now presents us with thyroid healing techniques which will complement our new diet. 1. The first technique is called the light infusion tonics. You will begin this technique by pouring a glass of water and setting it in front of you. Raise your hand above your head and curl it into a fist. As your hand is raised, visualize that it is filling with white light. Open your hand and point your fingers toward the glass and say light out loud. Visualize that the light from your hands is streaming toward the water. Do this procedure for a total of seven times. According to the author, this will turn the water into a divine transformative tonic. Gargle this water before swallowing it and make sure to visualize that the water is effectively killing the EBV cells in your thyroid. 2. The second technique is called the butterfly sun soaking. The author shares that the shape of our thyroid is similar to that of a butterfly. Moreover, just like the wings of a butterfly, our thyroid is capable of storing and collecting sunlight. In order to do so, we must try to soak up as much sunlight and direct it into our neck area where our thyroid is located. Exposure to sunlight works since it not only balances our body's hormone production, but it also powers up our thyroid while preventing the EBV from reproducing. 3. The final technique encourages us to ask for support from people with healthy thyroid glands. The author explains that our thyroid can produce radio-like frequencies which can be detected by another person's thyroid. Thus, when a healthy thyroid receives signals from an ailing thyroid, the former also sends out a healing signal to help the latter recover. For best results, make sure that you are standing not more than an arm's length apart from each other. Finally Healed, One Woman's Story In this chapter, the author shares the story of Sally Arnold, a person who once suffered from thyroid problems. The author proudly shares Sally's story because it is proof that the recipes and techniques listed in this book are effective in thyroid resurrection. Sally is a registered nurse who is passionate about helping people with their health. Ironically, she was also experiencing her own health challenges, which required her to undergo hormone replacement therapy in as early as her 20s. Unfortunately, the symptoms stayed with her despite taking medication and getting therapy, and it went on until she was in her 50s. This eventually led her to contact the author to ask for help. The author advised Sally to begin by cutting down the problematic food discussed under Chapter 21. She was also advised to load up on fruits and vegetables while taking up antiviral supplements. Little by little, this change in her diet helped Sally feel better. Sally 
eventually became convinced that she needed to stop her thyroid medication, so she decided to gradually lower her prescriptions. Within months of being medicine-free, Sally happily reported that her TSH level is now within the normal range, which proves that the diet is an effective way to tame the EBV in her system. After two years, Sally has fully embraced the thyroid resurrection diets and techniques discussed in this book. Currently, she no longer experiences panic attacks, constipation, back pains, and other autoimmune symptoms. She also noticed that her thyroid nodules, as well as the fungal growth in her toenails, were no longer there. Nevertheless, Sally shares that the biggest difference and her greatest relief was the improvement in her mental state. She shares that after she has finally embraced the lifestyle embodied in this book, she became overwhelmed by a sense of well-being. She no longer felt anxious and exhausted. She was finally happy and at peace. From Sally's story, we can see that it is perfectly possible to rebuild the thyroid. Change is possible if we know how to do so. Fortunately, this book has all the answers. Part 4 Secrets of Sleep Insomnia and Your Thyroid In the fourth and final part of this book, the author discusses the relationship between insomnia and our thyroid. Although emphasis must be placed on the fact that thyroid issues do not cause insomnia, sleep is nonetheless important in the healing process. There are various reasons why we experience insomnia, but a thyroid issue is not one of them. It may be because of an MSG buildup in our brain, or a clogged liver, or that you are experiencing pains from the EBV's neurotoxins. The author recognizes that not getting enough sleep is quite stressful. Fortunately, there are ways which can help give you better sleep. To get us interested, the author lists down the following reasons why we should continue reading the next chapters. 1. We will be able to determine what is causing our sleepless nights, and once we know what's behind the issue, then treatment will no longer be a mystery. 2. There are sleep secrets which we can use in order to fast-track our healing process. Your Sleep Wellspring Sleep remains a mystery even to the medical community. Nonetheless, the author believes that only one thing is certain, that we all deserve sleep. Laying emphasis on this fact is at the heart of this chapter. The author explains that sleep is not an ordinary bodily function, but a divine right given to us by the Holy Source. With this in mind, we should never feel guilty for choosing to sleep over working or studying. Society, however, thinks otherwise. Society demands too much time from us that we often end up being sleep-deprived. On the other hand, those who would always choose sleep are often labeled as lazy or have no goals in life. Because of the stigma, a majority of the population end up developing sleep issues. However, since sleep is such a medical mystery, science reveals no concrete answers yet. Fortunately, there are solid laws of sleep which will help us take the first step in addressing our sleep issues. The heart of these laws revolve around the fact that we have the fundamental right to sleep. The laws of sleep are as follows. 1. We have a sleep wellspring. According to this law, we earn two seconds of sleep with every breath we take. Think of it as an unlimited sleep supply which we're all entitled to 
simply because we are alive. Additionally, this sleep wellspring is being guarded by both the Holy Source and the Earthly Mother, so you are assured that it will never run out. Thus, keeping this law in mind whenever you feel like you didn't get enough sleep. 2. We have the power to allow ourselves to sleep. Having an unlimited sleep supply is only one part of the equation. The other part lies in giving ourselves the permission to enjoy it. The author shares that whenever we start to feel guilty about going to sleep, remind yourself that you are entitled to sleep as a matter of right, and no one can ever take that away from you. Now that we are acquainted with these laws, we finally ease up to the idea of getting more sleep. Once we feel more relaxed and entitled to it, and then we can formally begin with assessing and identifying our sleep issues. Identifying Sleep Issues We won't have a concrete answer to our problems if we don't know what these problems are in the first place. In this chapter, the author recognizes that there are various sleep issues caused by different factors. To help us determine our specific sleep issue, he lists down the common issues as follows. The inability to sleep after hours of tossing around in bed, then feeling restless as soon as you wake up. You often wake up in the wee hours of the morning and then experience an inability to go back to sleep you end up feeling frustrated and anxious as the sun starts to rise. You easily fall asleep, but wake up late at night. Unlike the previous problem, you eventually fall back to sleep, but it is already in the morning. You never enter the REM stage of sleep since you are in and out of bed, which is often accompanied by frequent trips to the comfort room to urinate. You are completely awake at night, which eventually leaves you without energy throughout the day. You feel exhausted throughout the day, which makes you excited to end the day and sleep. However, as soon as nighttime falls, you are completely awake. You experience a full night's sleep, but it doesn't feel like it's enough. Then, you get a report from your loved ones that you're either loudly snoring or shallowly breathing. In certain instances, you won't be told that you have breathing issues, but you do feel an overwhelming exhaustion which persists throughout the day, despite sleeping for about 8 hours. You are about to fall asleep, but you experience the sudden jerk of your arm or leg which jolts you up. This happens several times in the course of your sleep. You feel exhausted and ready to sleep, but your mind or body seems to be experiencing sensations which keep you awake like racing thoughts, restless leg syndrome, or tinnitus. Now that we are acquainted with these common sleep issues, we should now be acquainted with the top causes of sleep. The author lists them down as follows. 1. Viral activity causes hypersensitivity in our central nervous system, which keeps us alert at night. 2. Exposure to toxic heavy metals shuts down our neurotransmitters, which prevents it from sending sleep messages throughout the brain. 3. High MSG intake can also cause your nervous system to become hypersensitive. MSG is a known neuron antagonist and it can easily derail the brain's normal activities when taken in large amounts. 4. A sluggish liver due to high intake of fatty and processed food. Keep in mind that our liver also takes its rest when we sleep, but it fails to do so whenever we eat a lot of unhealthy foods. Because of this, our liver works hard 
even when we're asleep, and that churning can cause a disturbance in the body which eventually keeps us awake. 5. Digestive issues like bloating, cramping, or a sensitive stomach keeps the nervous system alert, which also explains how these issues can trigger sleeplessness. 6. Failure to let go of emotional wounds and traumatic experiences. 7. Sleep apnea, which results from a combination of MSG toxicity and heavy metal exposure, can cause blockages in our airways during sleep. Unfortunately, these blockages cause a chemical imbalance in the brain, which eventually leads to a feeling of exhaustion in the morning. 8. Adrenal fatigue, which means that your adrenaline is underactive during the day, but is hyperactive at night. This causes you to feel suddenly awake despite feeling exhausted throughout the day. 9. Being anxious can cause the brain to become hyperactive. Unfortunately, anxiety can be triggered by a lot of factors, including being fearful, nervous, having high degrees of DDT in the brain, or experiencing digestive problems. Healing Sleep Issues Now that we've identified our sleep issues, we can now proceed to healing them. In this chapter, the author provides us with a list of targeted solutions for each sleep issue. For those dealing with viral infection, high exposure to heavy metals, MSG toxicity, other toxin overload, the first step is to detoxify the body. Refer to the chapter on the 90-day thyroid rehab to get started. Those experiencing sluggish liver, adrenal fatigue, and digestive liver, make sure to take in more of the healing food and herbs discussed in previous chapters and avoid the unproductive ones like eggs and dairy products. Those experiencing adrenal fatigue are encouraged to remove adrenalized food from their diets. This not only makes you healthier, but it also calms down your adrenal glands so that you can finally enjoy a good night's sleep. For digestive issues, the author recommends eating food rich in probiotics and vitamin B12. These are supplements which are known to help and improve our digestive system. For obstructive sleep apnea, make sure to get a dose of food rich in 1-glutamine, 5-HTP, melatonin, magnesium, 1-threonate, glycine, and magnesium glycinate. This includes mangoes, wild berries, garlic, cilantro, sweet potatoes, lettuce, celery, spinach, asparagus, bananas, and cherries. In addition, for those who are always anxious, calm yourself down with an herbal tea brew made of raw honey, sweet potato, and avocado. Why bad dreams are good. In some instances, the main cause for lack of sleep is having bad dreams. These dreams tend to be so vivid and memorable that we'd rather not go back to sleep out of fear that it will have the same horrible dream. However, in this chapter, the author makes us realize that bad dreams are actually good for us. In fact, he shares that these dreams indicate that our system is fully operational. These bad dreams, he theorizes, are the soul's ways of healing itself. He explains that throughout the day, we have emotional walls up which serve as a filter for all these negative emotions. As we sleep, the brain is finally given the chance to process these emotions, and when the brain gets busy, these negative emotions begin to manifest through our sleep. Instead of looking at this process from a negative perspective, Think of it in this way. 
that it is our body's own way of releasing these emotions. Without being able to release them, these emotions will pile up in our system and can become troublesome in the long run. Of course, this doesn't mean that having good dreams is bad for you. Having good dreams means that you are experiencing a lot of positive emotions throughout your day, so there's nothing to worry about. To conclude, experiencing vivid dreams, whether good or bad, is perfectly normal and healthy. These dreams are neither challenges nor punishments. Instead, they are reminders that you are alive and that you have a body that's responsive and healthy. Thyroid problems are quite common. However, despite its seemingly regular occurrence, it is still considered as one of the biggest mysteries of our time. That is, until this book came along. In this book, the author shares that a common misconception in the medical community is that thyroid problems are caused by an autoimmune response of the body against the gland. They considered these problems as illnesses with their own category and tried to look for remedies from that standpoint. However, the author shares that these thyroid problems are not standalone illnesses. Instead, he proposes that these are symptoms of something bigger going on inside our bodies. In addition, once we come to accept these issues as mere symptoms, we then realize what the real problem is, the thyroid virus. The thyroid virus, according to the author, is a pathogen also known as the Epstein-Barr virus, EBV. The same virus which is responsible for causing mononucleosis. With this identified, shouldn't the treatment for thyroid issues become easier? Unfortunately, this is not always the case. The author explains that today's tests are not focused on detecting the virus. These tests merely focus on analyzing the patient's thyroid hormone levels and then make a prescription based on the results. However, since a person's TSH levels fluctuate from time to time, these tests rarely produce accurate results. To make matters worse, thyroid medication is also known to have adverse side effects on some of our vital organs, so it's best to stay away from them as much as possible. In the second part of the book, the author discusses the nine mistakes that we make or are made to believe which blocks us from full thyroid recovery. Among these mistakes include misconceptions about our metabolism, inflammation, and blaming ourselves for our illnesses. However, among these mistakes, the author lays emphasis on ignoring four external factors which largely contribute to chronic diseases. According to the author, radiation, viral explosion, DDT, and toxic heavy metals are among the items that the EBV loves to feed on. Thus, avoiding them greatly reduces the risk of contracting or waking up a dormant EBV. With everything discussed and the fact that the EBV can be extremely powerful, some patients may eventually feel helpless. This is especially disheartening for those who have already had their thyroid glands removed, who, after all, would then be in charge of sending signals to the various organs in the body. Fortunately, around 30-40% to 40 of the thyroid tissue stays intact even when the patient is made to believe that it has been completely removed. Even further good news is that the thyroid tissue can still perform in its functions despite only being a quarter of its original size. This fact is great news to us because this means that thyroid resurrection is achievable. To fully rebuild our thyroid, we must avoid the food which are considered as the EBV's favorites. This includes protein from dairy, 
eggs, and processed food rich in MSG. Conversely, we must also add EBV-fighting food and supplements into our diet. This includes cabbage, berries, sweet potatoes, magnesium, zinc, and vitamin B12, among others. Nonetheless, an improved diet is only one part of the equation. The other part requires us to adopt thyroid resurrection techniques and getting enough rest. Once we learn to live with all these factors, then we can truly say that we are on the path towards healing our thyroid.